In this video I show you how to run a growth mixture model GMM with R and the FlexMix package. This is the second video in a two-part series about analyzing latent trajectories. The first one was about latent class growth analysis. You can find a link to that tutorial in the video description. Both techniques have in common that they try to find subgroups in the growth pattern of a dependent variable. In GMM we don't assume homogeneous subgroups but we model random effects, that is random intercepts and possibly random slopes. Let's start with the code. The example dataset is from Wardenar 2022. You can find the full reference information in the video description. It's a simulated dataset and in the paper in the appendix you'll find R code with which you can generate this example dataset. So you can replicate the results from this tutorial for yourself. ID is the person. We have five time points for each person. Covariate isn't relevant for this tutorial and Y is the dependent variable. And we want to analyze whether we have different subgroups when it comes to the development over time of this variable Y. The data set is in the long format, so we have one row per time point and not one row per person. That's important. If you have data in the wide format, you first have to reorder your data so that you have your data in the long format. Before we start with the growth mixture model, let's plot the data. Here I use the ggplot package and first I change the id variable to a factor variable. Then I plot the data per person, per person by using this parameter group equals id. Here we can see the different linear trajectories for the 100 participants in this simulated study. This is a simulated data set, so in this example one probably could assume that we have two groups. Real life data in general is more messy there it will be very rarely possible to identify the subgroups just by looking at the plot. Nevertheless, I think it's a good idea to start with looking at the data. Let's start with the GMM using the library FlexMix. First, I'd like to fit a model with a random intercept, but no random slopes. That's a model in which the intercept for the different trajectories in one cluster can vary, but within one cluster everyone is assumed to have the same slope. Since there is a random component involved in this method, I always set a seed value in order to be able to replicate later on the results I got. The step flexmix function allows you to run a GMM with different numbers of latent groups or clusters, because in advance you don't know how many clusters you will have. And this way later on you can compare the results and decide based on some fit measures what's the best number of clusters for the data. This here is just a generic formula something is predicted by something and id is the person variable in our data frame. k the number of clusters. Here I start trying out between one and three clusters. If later on the three cluster solution were the best solution I'd be forced to try out even larger number of clusters because if the highest number of clusters is the best I don't know if an even higher number isn't even better. n rep number of repetitions that is number of random starting values because the algorithm can lead to so-called local optima where the solution cannot improve any further by the algorithm even though it is not the overall best solution. For that reason the program tries out different starting values chosen by random in the hope that one of those starting values will lead not only to a local best solution but to the overall best solution. And the more different starting values you try out, the higher the chance that you find the overall best solution. Here we have a rather simple model with only time as a predictor. For that reason 100 starting values could be enough. If you have a more complex model I'd recommend increasing this number even more. Then the model definition FLXMR and then LMM. LMM linear mixed model because a GMM is basically a multi-level model or linear mixed effects model fitted to this data for each cluster, that is for each subgroup. Y is predicted by time. Of course you could include other predictors, covariates. First we will fit a model only with a random intercept with no random slope, therefore random only tilde 1. And the var fixed parameter is about whether the random effects are fixed between groups, between clusters random equals false, so the random intercept can vary between clusters. There can be clusters with much more or much less variation in the intercept than other clusters. Residual fixed equals true, so the residual variance is fixed between clusters. Then the data frame in the long format and control is a tuning parameter, important iteration max, so it tries for each run 
at the most 1000 iterations. If later on, for one or more of the cluster numbers, you run into convergence issues, it's worth a try increasing that number. So to summarize, with this function, we try out one, two or three cluster solutions. For each of those solutions, we run this model 100 times. So overall, we run this optimization process 300 times. I cut the video to the time where the algorithm is finished. On my computer, it takes about nine minutes. Here we can get the results, the number of clusters, the number of iterations to come to a solution, and crucially, whether the algorithm did converge, because only then it makes sense to interpret the results. Here we have different fit measures. For a mixture model, I would use BIC or ICL to identify the best number of subgroups. I think ICL is the best one. Here, the two cluster solution has the lowest ICL value. So that would indicate for a random intercept model that there are basically two clusters in the data. If the three cluster solution had been the best solution, then we would be forced to try out even a four cluster solution because we wouldn't know whether the three cluster solution is the overall best solution or if an even larger number could further improve the solution. Next, I'd like to fit a model with random slopes too. We make it possible that not only the intercept is different within one cluster, but also the slope. I use basically the same code as before with one change, the random parameter. Now random is one plus time, so a random slope for our predictor variable time. This calculation is from a computing standpoint much more complex than the random intercept, so it will take much, much longer. On my computer, it takes more than two hours to run. So again, of course, I cut to the time point where it's finished. Now it's finished. Let's look at the results. For all three numbers of clusters, the solution converged. And looking at the ICL, the two cluster solution has the lowest ICL. So we definitely have a two cluster solution. Now we compare this value for the random slope model to the value for the random intercept model. And we can see for random intercept, we have a higher ICL than for the random slope model. So for that reason, we choose the random slope model. Now we will be looking at this model random slope with two clusters more in detail. For that, we extract the model object and then use the summary function. The prior is not that interesting. The size is the number of observations, not the number of persons. If we want to get the number of persons in each cluster or in each component, we have to divide this by the number of observations per person. Of course, that's only possible if you have the same number of observations for each person. So we have two clusters with 50 persons each. Post larger than zero posterior probability, there are 310 observations with a non-zero probability to be assigned to the first cluster. Or divided by five, there are 62 persons that have a non-zero probability to be assigned to cluster one. Ratio, that's the number grouped into that cluster divided by the number with a non-zero probability of being grouped into that cluster. High values are good. And here we can see a clear categorization. The vast majority of those with a non-zero probability of being assigned to a specific cluster are assigned to that cluster. Next, we use the parameters function. Here we get for both clusters, component one and component two, the model parameters, the fixed effect and the random effects. We can see both clusters have different intercepts, but more importantly, they have really different slopes for time. Cluster two has a much steeper slope than cluster one. Then the random parameters, sigma random, that's the variance covariance matrix. This is the variance of the intercept. This is the variance of the slope. And those two, that's the covariance between random intercept and random slope. And we can see that in cluster two, that is the cluster with a higher intercept and the larger slope, the variation in the intercept is much higher. But for both clusters, the variation in the slope is nearly the same. And sigma residual, that's the residual variance. That's the same for both groups because that's how we set up the algorithm. To assess how good the fit is, we can request a rootogram with a plot function. It's somewhat similar to a histogram. It's only for those observations with a posterior probability that's non-zero. But in contrast to a histogram, it's not about the frequency, but about the square root of the frequency. These two rootograms show a very good categorization because we have nothing in the middle. We have either a high probability of being assigned to a cluster or a low probability. However, this is a simulated data set. With real data, you won't get such a clear rootogram. You will have some observations in the middle. 
Up to now we looked at summary data, now let's look at specific observations. With the posterior function, we can check for each observation how large is the posterior probability of being assigned to a certain cluster. Here we get two columns, first cluster and second cluster, and this is per observation and not per person. Five observations, that is five time points for each person, get the same value, because the decision into which cluster an observation is grouped is made on the person level. So this is the result for person one. Here we can see 99% probability of being assigned to cluster 1 and a little bit less than 1% probability of being assigned to cluster 2. In most cases we are more interested into which cluster the person is grouped, that is, which is the cluster with the highest posterior probability. Here we see the results. Again, this is a simulated data set and it's not normal, of course, in real life data that the first half of the observations is grouped into one cluster and the second half into another cluster. To further investigate the clustering, we can add this cluster information to our data frame. So I define a new data frame data cluster and I assign the cluster as a factor variable to this data frame. Our original data frame with the additional variable cluster. So the first person was assigned to cluster 1. And we can use this information for additional analyses. First I'd like to plot the cluster membership. I use the same code I used at the start of this tutorial with one change. Color equals cluster. So now we will see by the color of the line to which cluster that person was assigned. And here we can see the two clusters and how the trajectories over time differ between those two clusters. Where to go from here? The next possible step would be investigating the cluster results, not only with a diagram, but with additional variables. In this example data set, we don't have any meaningful covariates. But in reality, in most situations, you will have all kinds of different information. For instance, age, gender, sociodemographic variables, outcome variables. And then you could look at how those additional variables relate to the cluster groupings. For instance, you could run a logistic regression to predict the cluster membership. In this example with two clusters, a binary logistic regression. If you had more than two clusters, a multinomial logistic regression. And then you could analyze which of the additional variables in your real-life data set significantly predict cluster membership. And if you have outcome variables, you can use the cluster variable to predict the outcome. Here with two clusters with a t-test, comparing the outcome variable between the two clusters. If you had more than two clusters, then with an ANOVA. If you'd like to get more information about how to report the results of a growth mixture model, for that I recommend an article by Van der Schoet et al. 2017. You'll find the full reference information in the video description. And you can find the full R code for this tutorial on a companion webpage. The link is also in the video description. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.